This is Eleanor Hospice in Gravesend, one of Kent's busiest hospices. A registered charity, Eleanor provides treatment to over 2,500 people, requiring care and support right across the county. The care that they deliver is free for people of all ages. 24 hours a day, 365 days of the year. I have my own little motto, and it's live life hard and fast and every day as if it's your last. You know, life is precious. When people realise they have a shorter time than they thought was likely, actually every moment matters. Their 200 strong staff and 600 volunteers are dedicated to making people's remaining days the best they can be. It's about just letting that person just leave the ward with dignity and respect. I'm sure every nurse in profession cares, but there's something special about hospice. Hi. Eleanor also take their support and treatment right into people's homes. <laughs> to have a really good cry is amazing. You may think a hospice is a place people come to die. Some people think as soon as you say the word hospice, that's the end of the road. But it's actually a place people come to live. There's a huge amount to offer. It is full of fun. It is full of laughter. You need to live life to the full. You don't know what's around the corner. So let's make the most of what we've got. Eleanor Hospice, it's the start of another working day for Sharon, a palliative care nurse specialist. Hi, Ashley, it's Sharon from the Eleanor. Can I speak to Karen, love? Hi, Karen. Sharon's duties include making regular home visits to Eleanor's many community patients. A few days ago, she visited Karen, a new referral to the hospice, yep, no, and she's now following that visit up with a phone call. It's just to um, make sure you're OK, see so if there's anything that you thought of from anything we spoke about earlier. OK, well, I'll give you a ring back after you've had your outpatient's appointment, but obviously if you're worried or concerned about anything before then, then just give us a ring um, and we'll see if we can help you before, OK? You take care. No problem. Bye. New patient. Really sad. Another young lady with brain tumour going for outpatient's appointment on Wednesday to see whether or not she can have chemo and things, but okay. really lovely. Daughter wants to be a paramedic. Done loads and bits and pieces for the Eleanor, so, yeah, sad, isn't it? So we give her a ring on um, Wednesday or Thursday for you know what happened with the outpatients and take it from there, I guess. Right. Okay. It's a shock, really. I've, I know a lot of people that have had cancers. A lot of them have breast cancer and they've got over it. But to to have a brain tumour, you just know there's no real going back. I was a bit oh, rational. Well some of the things I was saying. And then I kept getting up late for work. It was just like that, and it was just, I just didn't care. After being oversleeping in the mornings, after that, that's when I had the seizure. That 17th of December, unfortunately, Karen went into a fit, um, had to call the paramedics, and they decided that they need to do an emergency operation to remove this tumour. It's very scary, but for the future, do you know? Because you just know what's going to happen. Right, post come, Karen. This looks rather like your next appointment. So, Friday the 2nd at yep. 11 o'clock? Yeah. This last time they said you weren't yeah. quite fit enough yeah. for the treatment, didn't they? Yeah. But hopefully, on Friday, they'll say all steam ahead. Yeah. So, how do you yeah. feel about that? Yeah, what? Got to happen, innit? Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, me and Karen have been together basically 31 years. We've been married for the last 11. As I said, we had a wonderful wedding. Um, had a great life with Karen, you know, we've got two lovely kids, Shannon and Charlie, they've, they've grown up to be real diamonds. You've got a lot stronger in the last week or so, haven't you? Yeah. Look how much easier you get yeah. up the stairs, so, you know, yeah. hopefully she's going to give us the, the go-ahead. Yeah. This could make things better for oh, yeah. quite a period of time, couldn't it? Yeah. Which is, that's what we need, isn't and it? And I've got to have whatever time. treatment they offer me, you know, yeah. so whatever yeah, so. happens. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, it's fine. I'm fine with it. Unfortunately, the, the end the end is not going to be good, there's not actually a cure. They intend giving her chemotherapy, but this will only be life prolonging. Hopefully we'll get the all clear to go ahead with the chemo, which hopefully will make Karen's time better and longer. 
you know, you was a bit upset when I... Well, you, you didn't like it when I got a little bit emotional when we was yeah. talking to Sharon yesterday. Yeah. Well, um, the trouble is, the reason that is, is I'm thinking, like, how sad it would be for Shannon and Charlie to be... not have mum yeah. there on their special days. Mm. And it does bring a tear yeah. to my eyes. It yeah. really does, you know. And, um, it's, I, know. I said it's inevitable, but, like... I, I don't, you know, I don't normally cry. You know, oh, yeah. Twelve years of big, big tufty fireman, yeah. you know what I mean? But even firemen cry, you know. So mm. it happens. Right. Yeah. You've you've got to get on with life, you know. There's no point in sitting back out, you know. If the however bad the problem in front of you is, practical solutions is the best way through it. Obviously, that's the worry when it starts getting bad and it starts really playing up, and so yeah, and that's the worry thinking how much pain I'll be going through. And I know they've got drugs and stuff, but, um, yeah. Back at Eleanor, Roger, the head groundsman, is hard at work in the garden. Roger's been with the hospice for almost 11 years, but has finally made the decision to retire. So this is his last week on the job. Someone donated a nice pergola that you can put climbing roses up, and we've just been and bought three roses, three climbing roses, to put up it. So I'm just going to plant them in close to the pergola. Th this is one of the roses we've planted. They've got a nice fragrant smell because um, we're outside the treatment rooms here. So we think it's important um, for patients and visitors in the garden to be able to, not only the colour, but the smell. Actually, that's gone pretty well. I've worked to the hospice for just about coming up to 11 years and it's just been a joy to work here. Uh, I think the highlight of working at the Elena has been really meeting all the different people. Uh, I've met some amazing people who have done some amazing things with their lives and there's all sorts of people from the young to the old but they make the hospice what it is and it, it's been a wonderful place to work and I've really enjoyed the last 11 years probably as much as I've enjoyed any of my working life. has been working as part of the children's respite team at Eleanor for eight years. Right, I'm off to see Kira. Hi. I'll see you later. Kira was born with epidemiolosis bullosa, a skin condition for which there is currently no permanent cure. Any friction to her skin, no matter how mild, causes it to come out in painful blisters, so Kira has to wear bandages all over her body to keep her skin as well protected as possible. So I've known Kira for coming up to eight years now. I'm really proud because I've looked after her since she was four, so to see her go from nursery to primary school to then get into a grammar school, nothing stops her. She wants to do everything. She doesn't let her condition hold her back. So I'm collecting Kira from school. We'll head down to Tesco's and I will give her the money to be able to pay for the snack or the drink or whatever she wants. This helps with life skills to be able to purchase her own food and drink. We're now getting her ready for that time where she's on her own. She's out shopping. That's what we're equipping her to be able to do. She's to make her as independent as she possibly can. What are we doing today, Kira? <laughs> um, right, so if we go to Tesco's first, and then we'll try and make some slime. <laughs> Cowboy. My name is Kira, I'm 12 years old and I'm in Year 7. And when I'm older, I want to be either a children's author or a makeup artist. So what's, what's happening with your feet? Uh, well... I uh, banged it today. What on? On uh, the uh, desk. Ouch. Kira is suffering a lot at the moment with her feet because the blistering happens everywhere. With our skin, we're able to move it back and forth and nothing happens. But with Kira's skin, if I was to brush it, the top layer of her skin would cause a blister. So we have to be very gentle with what we're doing with her. She walked on her tiptoes um, because that's the most comfortable way for her. Right, let me know if you need any help, OK? OK. Usually at the weekends we change all of my bandages to uh, set me up for the week. If we were doing everything, it will probably take three to four hours. Right. Do you want to hold them or do you want me to? Yes. Got them? Yeah. Don't drop them now. <laughs> right, come on then. 
it's important that she does things like that, paying for her own food and snacks, so that when she is out on her own, or even when she's with her parents or her friends, she has that confidence to be able to go over and do that. Actually, for her to do that is a, is a massive deal because she's putting her condition out there for someone else to see, and she's like anyone, she doesn't want to be judged, she doesn't want the questions, and for someone to not say something can just do it. I think that gives you a little bit of a, oh, I did that. That makes me happy. <laughs> you should put them in your pocket. My pockets aren't big enough. Would you like me to do it? Yeah. <laughs> right. Balance them. Put one in each pocket. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Sorted. <laughs> right. The condition is not her. She is a normal child. She's just got some other things that she has to deal with and she does it and doesn't moan about it. She's just my little bit of sunshine in some of my bad days. So she's a good, a good little one to look after. It's not just patients who benefit from the care Eleanor Hospice provides. Support for carers and the bereaved is another of the invaluable services on offer. An example of this is a regular get-together held at the hospice called Carer's Cuppa. For me, the aim of the Carer's Cuppa is to have a place to meet on a regular basis that is local to where people live, that's easily accessible, um, that provides support and guidance. Um, most carers that come in just want a listening ear. Good morning. Hello there. Hello. You're all right? Yeah. I'm all right. How nice are you? Nice to see you. Nice to see you. And you? How are you today? Oh, good, thank good. you. You guys obviously no but a high proportion of the people that are coming to the carers group now have actually been bereaved and so we need to manage that a little bit better however the support the bereaved people give the carers we know is is invaluable so it's something that I'm looking at at the moment um, in the meantime we open our doors to anybody I think the loveliest thing is when you look at how far some people have come on a very difficult journey and they absolutely love coming here because they they just relax, they see their friends, they're very isolated, some people. I think for some of the group, actually, this group is their only socialisation, you know, the only time to meet with other people in the week. I think one of the things that strikes me as well is the experiences that we've all had uh, with significant losses and that caring role. How long ago did your husband die, Sue? Seven and a half years. Right. And next month would have been our 50th wedding anniversary. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oh, wow. He'd be oh, proud yeah. of you. He'd be well proud of you. Yeah. yeah. And the, all the things that you've achieved in oh, that yeah. time. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I had already started as a volunteer back in 2011, uh, after my husband died. And I think we, the three of us get on very well and support each other in and out of the groups, don't yeah. we? And, it, and if one of us is having a, uh, an emotional day or feeling a bit um, vulnerable, then we can identify that and support each other in, in the same way that we would support the other service users. Morning, how are you? Well, morning, George. Hello, George. George has been a regular visitor with us from day one. He's been uh, um, committed to uh, attending every opportunity he can. Right, yours is coming, George. Have a seat. Oh, you know what's in there? No, I don't. What is in there? Wow, and the knife, man alive. George is very isolated, which is sadly um, what happens with a lot of carers. George does an amazing job caring for his wife, um, and he also utilises any group that he can for that 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 um, socialisation. So, how are you feeling in yourself? Are you just yeah, I'm all right. you're okay? You're yeah. just worried that Sue's gone a bit quiet. She's blind, isn't she? And she's deaf, and she's well, got the schizophrenia, yeah. and she's got yeah. other health issues, hasn't she? Oh yeah, yeah, Half right, and yeah. All that sort of stuff, yeah. Like yeah. How do you cope? You just cope. Mm. That's what you can do. You just cope. Mm. I was working it out the other day. It's been 50, 55 years that I've been caring for my man. So yeah, my man, you say, yeah. For everyone.
He really relies on this group to provide him with the support and encouragement. But George is a support to other people as well. He's always caring about other people within this group. The care Eleanor offers is not confined to the building. Yeah. It provides outreach services within the community. Today, Hannah, a member of the children's respite team, is spending the afternoon looking after Kira, who suffers from a rare skin disorder. Having bought some snacks, it's off to the children's centre to have some fun getting their hands dirty. The toughest thing about having EB is that I can't really do things that other children do, so I can't run or jump or I can't really take part in PE. Is it just glue in that then? Yeah. Pretty much. OK. Do you want me to pour the glue in and then you can pour it from yes. there? Yes. Kira is so brave. I, I have seen her at her best and I've seen her at her worst. She's had operations that I've got in and looked after and she'll have this big boxing glove where the, the cast is over her hand so she can't actually use her hand. She uses the other hand. Nothing has ever stopped her doing anything. It smells like primary school. It does smell, yeah, it does smell like primary school, doesn't it? For me, starting at 20 to now 28, I'm a completely different person than I was when I started because I've been through so much. <laughs> Kira's been there the whole time, so I've seen her grow, I've seen her develop into who she is, and that gives me that little bit of like, oh, she is just so amazing that I just think, oh, I love my job. I love my job because of children like her. Yeah. Hello. Hi, Daddy. How are you? Hello. Everything all right? <laughs> yeah. This is the stuff you want to bag up and sell as a business, is it? Yeah. Yeah. Kira's uh, been incredibly brave throughout her uh, childhood and uh, obviously going into uh, teenage years. She's had to put up with uh, constant pain. There, there hasn't been a day in her life where she hasn't been in pain. She's one of the bravest people I know, and that's in no small part to what the Eleanor have done helping her and, and building her up into the, the person that she is today. It's not always doom and gloom. It's happy. We're making that child's quality of life the best we can, we can physically do. In the hospice garden, groundsman Roger is carrying out some repairs. Roger's retirement day is fast approaching and his friends and colleagues are hoping to make his last day a day to remember. Hi, Dan, you all right? Hello, Bob. Just come in to talk about okay. Roger's leave and do on Friday. Mm -hmm. Have you got anything in mind you like particularly want? Uh, a Victoria special? sponge. One yeah. of your classic lemon drizzles. We can do that for you. Yeah, just so that they've got a bit of a mixture. Yep, no problem. Happy to help, you know, we've got stuff. If you could make him one of your special Cornish pasties. Oh, yeah. Who are we going to sell them to now he's leaving? <laughs> We're getting them all. I swear we can send them to him. Yeah, we've got to make it special. He's, a, he's one of the good ones. But we'll put it all, all on for him. Okay. Uh, nothing's right. too much, you know. We'll check in with you on Friday. No problem. Thanks, Dan. Thank Cheers. Ta ta. There's been a big turnout for today's Carers' Cuppa get-together. Two of the guests, who have remained outside the main room, are chatting with senior staff nurse, Sarah. Hi, how are you? Oh, thank you. Good. You had a good week? Up and down. Had a bit of a row with him before I came out. OK. How's that making you feel? Frustrated, annoyed, mm. isolated. They chose not to come into Carers' Cuppa for the first part this morning. They were both feeling quite upset, sad and angry. Uh, one of them particularly had had a disagreement with their husband, who is our patient. It's quite unique what Malcolm mm. has, isn't it? Yeah, there's only ever 3,000 people in the country with it at one time. And what's it called again? Multiple systems atrophy. Right, OK. Um, better as MSA. Yeah. Um, Did you say Parkinson's with attitude? Yeah. Parkinson's with attitude, yeah. yeah, yeah. If I am having a go at him, it's not that I mean to, it's just that, you know, he knows I'll go out. So do you think he's angry with you, or do you think he's angry with the situation? He's angry with the illness. Yeah. What's the hardest thing you find about caring? Not being able to go out and to be myself. You know, if I want to go out, it takes a lot of planning that somebody, if my son can't do it, I'd get neighbour to come in, 
Um, it's a lot of planning. They text each other outside of this group. They know how each other feels because they're going through the same sort of experience both of them being quite isolated, both of them not having the answers. Their future doesn't look as rosy as what they wanted it to. What we planned to do is not what life's all about now. We would have paid off the mortgage and we were going to go off and do all the travelling and stuff that we didn't do beforehand. And now that's not a possibility. Yeah. Yeah. So today, obviously, you've turned up. It's been a difficult week for both of you. It's difficult just to walk into the group sometimes when you just need some time out. It's nice just to catch up with you quietly one to one and you know we're always there for that just give us the nod and the wink and then we'll come out and <laughs> we'll, we'll find somewhere quiet to talk it was really good to see them come in in the state they did but support each other we'll get them <laughs> I spent a brief time with them and then they were happy to come back into the group where they were welcomed and actually they were missed Wait, they, they knew that they weren't there so that was really lovely too Groundsman Roger has made many friends during his time at the hospice. With his last day around the corner, he's reminiscing with two of the gardening volunteers. And what we're going to do without a head, head groundsman? Oh, no, I think, well, I think you're all fairly qualified now. You all know what you're doing, and I think you'll find that you can carry on. And we will miss you, Roger. Yeah, we will, it's, yeah. You know, really it's been, been here a long time coming. Yeah, so I'm going to miss you guys. It, it, it's, um, and I, you know, no, I appreciate... That's like six or seven years. Yeah, I think I've yeah, been coming. Yeah, yeah no, I appreciate all your help because I couldn't have done it without you guys. Yeah. You don't know how many people you've touched, Roger, over the years. Yeah. Oh, people think you think a lot of you and you've done well, a great that's, job. That's nice to hear, yeah. I appreciate yeah. it. Carers Cupper also offers support for the bereaved. Linda lost her husband Philip almost two years ago. Staff nurse Sarah catches up with her for a chat. I'm enjoying my new job. Brilliant. So we're getting into the routine of that. Doing lots of hours? No, um, that's the beauty of it, just Tuesdays and Fridays. I've known Linda probably about nearly two years now. I think the disease progression with her husband was very quick. How I met Philip was through work. I had to work with a freight forwarder called Mr Philip Rush, who was very bossy on the phone. And then it was coming up to Christmas time, he invited me out to a work stew. And then the rest is history. We, we clicked um, quite soon. I moved in and 18 months later we got married. It's difficult this time of year because two years ago Philip was here in the hospice yeah. and it was all happening. And I think for you, I mean the story, it happened, things happened quite quickly, didn't they? Yes, um, and it, I, I didn't have time to realise we didn't have time. Basically, it was a time. time to plan. Carers Kappa, to me, represented friendship, companionship and information. The, the tea and the coffee were, were extra. Life goes on, it, uh, yes, it doesn't get easy, easier. It's just, uh... And why should it when you love somebody? So how does it feel now, moving into the second new year? Does that feel more hopeful? It or? does make it feel more hopeful. I still got Philip's suits and good shoes to find a good home for, but I'm ready to do that now. Linda um, is now in that part of uh, her journey where she's looking at changing things, and I know she's now looking at, at dealing with some of Philip's belongings and his clothes, which is a tough thing to do. It's very final. It's been very cathartic. Yeah. But I'm sure there's some things you don't want to change. Oh, no. No, I don't want no. to change. No, no. His cap, his flat cap, is still on the end of the radiator in, in the kitchen where we put it to let it dry. And that will always stay there. And that's comforting? Yeah. Yeah. That's comforting. Yeah. Yeah, I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's not easy. No. But we're fine. <laughs> Forty-eight-year-old Karen was diagnosed with a brain tumour just over a month ago. She's undergone several brain scans and today has an appointment to find out whether or not she's fit enough to undergo radio and chemotherapy. Ah, oh, you're nearly ready. That's excellent because we've got to leave fairly soon. All right. All right. Um, yeah. Make sure we get a decent parking space as close as we can. What, to right. the hospital? Yeah. You should talk ready? about that bit of hair there. I was going to... Trim that down to match the rest. I'll but get Lisa to do that. You don't trust me, do you? No. <laughs> Not as a hairdresser, no. <laughs> Come here. Stay still. Quickly. 
No, you're not cutting it with them because they're proper oh, kitchen no, scissors. This. <laughs> Hairdressing scissors are in there. Are they? We'll leave it for Lisa then, yeah, shall we? Yeah, let Lisa do it. Okay, let's just go and damn sight quicker than the rest. That's so. what she can trim that yeah. next. She'll be wearing some. Okay. With this upcoming appointment, we're wanting results. Well, the results that we all want, unfortunately, are not going to happen. So it is a major discussion on what's best oh, for God. Karen. Um, and making thing, making Karen very comfortable and happy in the time that we do have. Karen and husband Ashley run through a list of questions they're keen to ask her consultant during the appointment. So Karen, yeah, what have we got, what have we got on that list? First question is suitability for chemo. Yeah, yeah, that's a definite one. And then time scales in more depth. Yeah, yeah. Mental capacity, appetite. Yeah. Well, weight gain. Yeah, well, you have got no a big appetite switch. at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, well, unfortunately, you have got no off switch with the eating at the moment. Have you? Flight to bed or fast? Yeah, well, if we can, if we can put that to go, I think we're going to have a complete no-no on the, that trip. But we'll try and go somewhere else. Yeah. Yeah. All right. What else have we got down there? What's best for me? Yeah, we had an appointment three weeks ago, and the situation was that at the time Karen wasn't deemed fit enough to 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 go go ahead for for chemo today. They're reassessed. Obviously, the scan that was done earlier in the week will be compared to previous ones, and that's what they're going to make their decision on on where we go forward. How do you feel, Karen? Um, yeah, a bit. Oh, I don't know, really. <laughs> I just, just got to accept it, haven't you? Yeah, what, yeah. Whatever they tell you, you just got to accept yeah. it. <laughs> I don't even know where I'm going. But it says oncology there, doesn't oh, it? Oh, yeah, I'm going that there. Does. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that'll do. Linda's husband, Philip, passed away almost two years ago. Thanks to the support provided by Eleanor and counselling groups, she finally feels ready to part with some of her husband's belongings. The time has come when I must find a suitable home, a good home for Philip's shoes and his jackets. I think he would have been saying to me, just get on with it, Linda. Why have I chosen now to finally give Philip's clothes away? I think it's because I need to. I've left them in the wardrobe thinking, I'll deal with that tomorrow, I'll deal with that tomorrow. And now I just hear Philip sitting on my shoulder saying, Linda, stop faffing around. Just get on and do it. And now's the time. So I'm, they're going to go, to, they're going to go. I would open that side of the wardrobe and see them to get my clothes out. They worried me. They weren't a comfort. They didn't expect that. What have you just found? Just place? a handkerchief. You always liked proper cotton handkerchiefs, white, no colour. So business cards and handkerchief in that one. It was strange seeing the, um, the handkerchiefs today. Yeah, that, that was a comfort. But no, they had to go. But I wanted them to go at the right time. Oh, a red handkerchief. That must have been, oh, his dinner suit, because he had a red bow tie. Mm. I can see him wearing that. Oh, another handkerchief. <gasps> Goodness me. They're only objects. Yeah, he's around everywhere. <laughs> Yes, it's the closure, end of a, a chapter. His clothes are in the boot of the car. And now I'm going to treat myself. I'm meeting up with a friend. We're going for a lovely walk on the marshes and we will end up having a good talk and a, and a coffee. And I'm ready. Over 90% of the care Eleanor provides happens outside the hospice. Church minister and accountant Elizabeth is one of those community patients. Elizabeth has stage 4 cancer and has been referred for 12 counselling sessions to help her through this challenging stage of her life. I was diagnosed first of all with melanoma in 2015, um, in the spring. In 2016, um, it was discovered that I had swollen lymph nodes and when they did some further testing, they discovered that the cancer had spread to my liver, to my lymph nodes, to my spleen and to my lungs. 
I'm on my way to a counselling session with Sophie. It's, um, I was a little bit nervous the first time I went, but I found that she was really good to talk to and it's actually quite relaxing. I think that when you're first diagnosed with cancer that's spread, there is that real shock and you're, you, it takes you weeks at least to come to terms with the fact or come to terms as much as you ever will with your situation. But eventually things start to get a little bit better. And I think the hit, you hit a point where six, nine, 12 months into it, you realize that your life is going to be always like this. And it's really quite hard and I needed some help. And so I came to Eleanor and Eleanor said, yes, they could offer me counseling and they thought it would really help me. It's really important to us that we don't just see patients and clients in Eleanor at Gravesend in the hospice. So what Sophie's doing today is to see a patient um, who lives in this area and find it much easier to get here than she would to get to the hospice itself. It was really interesting after the last session. You know, we were talking about um, how you said my daughter would know much more about how I was feeling than I was giving her credit for mm -hmm. and how I needed to open up to her and to sort of be honest with her. And the postman came to the door and it was um, three books from Amazon. One was a book called Calm, one was a book called Happy and one was a happy journal. <laughs> and when I looked, they were all from my daughter. I just couldn't believe it. And how was that to have all those things that perhaps you didn't realise you were putting out there, to have them so received? It was lovely. It, do you know, it was such a, I mean, it was a relief in a way because I, there's no point in trying to hide anything from her anyway. She'll know anyway. When you're told that you've got cancer, that, um, that is pretty devastating for you and for your family. And it's a huge thing to take on board. Eleanor provides transport for some of the most vulnerable patients in the community. And thanks to charitable donations, was able to purchase two minibuses. Today, Director of Patient Care Jackie has been asked to speak with Facilities Manager Bob, who has some shocking news regarding the vehicles. Hi, Bob. Hi, so Jackie. Asked me to come and see you about the minibuses. Oh, yeah, OK, yeah. This morning, one of the volunteers come in, who was one of the drivers, and said the exhaust pipe had blown. Oh. So I went out to have a look and said to him, right, use the other minibus. He said the other one was exactly the same. So I thought, well, that was a bit strange. So I got underneath the minibuses to have a look and realised that the catalytic converters had been cut off both minibuses. Oh Obviously, they've been stolen overnight. Yeah, and it's also going to cost an absolute fortune to put right. Um, we've cancelled the day patients who were going to be collected by the minibuses. Right, I'll speak with Tim and Tracy, okay. um, and then we'll think about a plan and see how long it's going to take to get them repaired. Okay. And then think about the patients and how they're going to access day therapy okay. next week. If there's anything else you need, yeah, just sure. come back All and right. see me. Thanks, okay, thank you. Back at Elizabeth's counselling session, therapist Sophie has some further questions she wants to explore with the minister. I'm sensing something and I can't place it. Perhaps a fear of rejection. I think there's something about that. When my dad was working away in the week because he was working in the south and every week he left on a Sunday night and then he came back on a Friday night. And I remember hating that. Mm. I used to get really upset when he left. And I know that caused me, you know, that upset me a lot. But we hold on to things. Oh. They shape us and we grow around them and we make sense of the world from our experiences. Mm. And if one of the senses you've made is people can go away and yes. I don't understand why they're going. Yes, because at that age I wouldn't have understood why he was going. And we talked a bit about how it was sort of like the shoe was on the other foot now because in a sense I'm the one that's going to be doing the leaving. I'm going to be leaving my family. And how that was making me feel for me, the idea of leaving my family, leaving my children, leaving my husband, I think it's one of the hardest things. And a lot of the feelings, the thoughts I have about that, I think probably stem from the feelings I had as a child. And then sort of almost putting those into that situation that I'm sort of almost creating, even though it's not a situation of my own making. I still find partings, separation, very difficult. So any form of transition like that. And how do you feel now that you're facing the ultimate parting? You, you are going oh, away and not coming back. Devastating. 
yeah, the ultimate. I mean, yeah, leaving my children, particularly leaving my husband. Eleanor community patient Karen is suffering from a brain tumour. She and her husband Ashley have just been to see a consultant to find out whether or not she's fit enough to undergo potentially life-prolonging treatment. She says that I'd have to have chemo and radiotherapy, didn't she? Yeah, radio and chemo. Yeah. And the positives I take from that is that there's varying grades depending on how well you are and Karen is now looking fit enough to have the, the, the toughest grade as such, which will prolong life for, for longer. So it's, I took today as very positive. It's never going to be totally positive on a subject like this, but it's looking more positive than it did a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, so, yeah. So far, the hospice, the main contact I have, have, have had is with Sharon, and um, she's referring us to various different departments within the hospice that um, Karen's going to get taken to sort of day groups where she can have foot massages, a bit of pampering, and all that sort of thing. They've got various support groups to help us as a family, to help, to help Karen on her own, to even even support for the children, you know, that you couldn't want for more help. It's happened and you, you've got to live with it, haven't you? There's nothing you can do about it other than take the treatment and hopefully it will prolong my life and I'll live longer and, you know. But yeah, no, it's, I'm all right, I'm OK. I'm quite tough like that. Elizabeth, a church minister and accountant, has stage four cancer and is having a counselling session with therapist Sophie. It's difficult to know when you've got something like cancer, um, who to tell and who not to tell. And I was naturally protective of my mum. So one of the things I wanted to talk to Sophie about was how I'd protected my mum from my cancer. It's interesting that there's a duality there of the structure and the change. And that's very much the situation you're in now. Mm. That you, you had kind of quite a structured, you know where your yeah, life yeah, was yeah. going, and now that very much been disrupted. Oh yes, yeah. And I wonder, I wonder what your mum would say to that. One of the first things I thought when she died was I was, I didn't at least then have to hide the fact that I had been diagnosed with skin cancer about six months earlier from her anymore because I hadn't told her. Um, and in fact I hadn't told my brother um, because I was afraid that he might let it slip um, to her because I didn't want her to know, because I knew she would worry about it. She would not have coped at all with it. When I had the brain tube 10 years ago, I didn't tell her. I, I, I played it right down. I told my dad, he knew. Two minibuses belonging to Eleanor Hospice have been targeted by thieves who have stolen vital components. So I came into work this morning to be told that last night vandals have removed the catalytic converters from the exhaust systems of both our minibuses, rendering them inoperable. This is going to primarily affect the patients who access our day and wellbeing services. They're some of the most vulnerable and um, dependent patients that we care for. Um, it's just hard to believe that anybody would want to do this to the minibuses of a charity. Word of the theft has spread quickly, and the local news arrives to interview Director of Patient Care, Jackie. Uh, give us an idea what exactly happened here. I'll sit at home and I'll go, why did I say that? That sounds horrible. But anyway, there we go. Upward and onward. <laughs> You know that most people, when they ask you how you are, what they want to hear you say is, I'm fine, I'm really well, I'm doing really well, I'm feeling a lot better. Actually, people really want to hear you say, I'm cured, you know, I'm better now, but I'm never going to be able to say that to them. That those three or four months when I really, you know, was obviously ill, yeah. it, they couldn't escape it. Once I got back to work and I was doing normalish things mm. again, everybody could go back to normal mm. and it was almost it receded into the background and although I've kept trying to say to them all you know I'm not cured this isn't going to go away mm. this is how it is what I don't want is a conspiracy of actually it's all all right now we're coming to the end of our session but maybe this is something in our next session we mm. can consider ways of alternative communication and maybe be able to keep some of that stability that, yeah. that you're all feeling secure in. 
and um, maybe there's a midpoint somewhere we can find. Yeah, no, that would be good. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think Elizabeth is a very brave woman. I think she's a very caring and confident person and I think that definitely impacts how she copes. It's a really challenging situation she is in and she manages it incredibly well. You suddenly realise what's really important in life, which is your family, but you also realise how much of your life is defined by who you are and what you do. So have all that taken away by this illness because it was like, I suddenly lost everything. The only thing that kept me going at that time, in the, and it was a really dark period, was you know the love of family and friends, and then all the prayer support I had, and knowing that you know the one thing I could trust was that God was still there. When you're in that down place, that black place, your choice is either to curl up in a ball and feel completely miserable and say, I'm dying and this is the end of everything. Or else you can say, well, okay, this is happening. There's lots of lovely people here to help me. So let's make the most of what we've got. And you know, that, that's your choice. That's where you, you choose life. A few days have passed since brain tumour sufferer Karen's appointment with her consultant and palliative care nurse specialist Sharon is phoning Karen's husband Ashley for an update. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry. Unfortunately, since the appointment, Karen and Ashley have received some disappointing news. Take care. Bye, love. Bye. Oh, that is really sad. Go on. So they went to their outpatient's appointment yeah. and were told that it looked like there'd been a really good job done and that they'd been able to take out um, a lot of the tumour um, and there would be chemotherapy and radiotherapy, which meant that Karen would have... Um, a good chance in, in Ashley's words of, of lasting a year. Then in the afternoon, they get a phone call saying, a bit of an issue. Kings are telling me that they've seen more on the scan and actually it's infiltrated its way into two other parts of the brain. Oh. So we won't be able to do um, chemotherapy, it's just going to be radiotherapy. But what they will do is they'll give her a radiotherapy and then they will rescan so that they can do a before and after and then that will give them some idea of whether or not the radiotherapy's managed to shrink anything down or and then take it from there. But that's, that's like a double whammy, isn't it? That's, that's really sad, isn't it? Thank you. The staff at Eleanor are preparing for Roger the Groundsman's retirement party. Thank you, Bob. Oh, thanks, Debs, thank you. We've got a little bit more if they need any more. Juice, tea and coffee. Thank, thank you. you. Oh! Oh, surprise! Hey. <laughs> well, I never. So, um, it, I've got a few things I, I'd like to say, and I don't know what part of um, I don't want a party Bob didn't understand. <laughs> Today, I've absolutely dreaded, if I'm honest. I, I've not slept for two nights, worrying about... N not this particularly, but just about saying goodbye to you all, because um, it's been an absolute pleasure working with you all. I've thoroughly, I, honestly, I've, 11 years, it's gone like that. And I, I, as Bob said, we've never had a crossword. Bob's been absolutely uh, brilliant to work with and for. He basically lets me do what I want, which is the ideal <laughs> boss. The hospice does a very hard job, um, but they do it well. They do it really well. And the staff, the volunteers, that come and, uh, and do the work here are absolutely fantastic. And it, it's a wonderful place and it's a wonderful organisation. And, um, you know, I wish them all the success and I wish, obviously, all the, all the people here that, that uh, continue in the, the same success and um, long may it go on, because it is a wonderful place. So the last 11 years have been very enjoyable in that time. It's uh, been a wonderful place to work. I've met some lovely people, both patients, volunteers. It's not been an easy decision, but I just feel it's time for me to go and I want to explore some other avenues. And I, so I've really enjoyed the, the last 11 years. It's been extremely good for me. It's the end of another busy week at the hospice and Director of Patient Care Jackie has just received some very welcome news. We are overwhelmed. We've received in excess of £5,000 to help us repair our minibuses. We've been absolutely inundated with offers of support, people offering to loan us vehicles so that our patients can access our day therapy and wellbeing services next week. 
while the vans are being repaired, it's absolutely phenomenal. And um, we're just so touched by the support from our local community. It, it's just incredible.